Today's stories. The world is set to bust global warming goal, but the United Nations is cool on the threat from Trump. UNICEF says teacher pay delay worsens Yemen education crisis. Islamic State claims responsibility for a deadly Kabul blast. Trump nominee for key justice post reiterates promise to support Russia probe. Lavrov says allegation of Russian meddling in the U.S. and Europe elections are fantasies. Kremlin notes the U.S. case against ex-Trump aides does not accuse Russia. Plus, aid for humanity in New York touches the Bronx community. And FYM Foundation sends aid for humanity to Canada, helping Vancouver residents in need. Hello everyone, I am Sarah Nachman bringing you stories from around the globe. And this is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. The United Nations said on Tuesday greenhouse gas emissions are on course to be about 30 percent above the 2030 global target. But these are signs of a move away from fossil fuels that not even U.S. President Donald Trump can stop. Jennifer Pulintan reports. U.S. President Donald Trump has announced he will pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement, under which 195 countries pledged to try to keep global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial times. An annual U.N. audit of progress toward that goal shows emissions are likely to be 53 to 55.5 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year by 2030 far above the 42 billion ton threshold for averting the two degree rise. Released just days ahead of the climate COP, the report clearly indicates that national pledges will only bring a third of the reductions in emissions required to meet climate change targets. But UN Environment Chief Eric Solheim hailed signs of progress, with an apparent three-year plateau in carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels cement production, and other industrial processes, largely due to slower growth in coal use in China and the United States. Energy and climate specialist John Christensen said Trump's announcement may not change the picture a lot as private companies and cities remain committed to the Paris climate goals. It's difficult to sort of right now judge what happens with the U.S. because it's basically the president announcing they go out. So we don't know what's actually going to happen in the country because a lot of private companies, a lot of the states and cities have committed themselves to action and they're going to act no matter what the president says. So we actually expect the U.S. will more or less meet its targets. And at the same time, the U.S. targets were not extremely ambitious, so therefore they're not that hard to meet. So we don't expect that will change the picture a lot. It, it may change the political dynamics overall. That's very difficult to judge. But on the ground, things are going to happen anyway. For Eagle News, I'm Jennifer Polentan, and I am one with 25. Thank you, Jennifer. UNICEF warns with 2 million Yemeni children out of education and 2,000 schools damaged by ongoing conflicts, delays to teachers' salaries, and perils a system already on the brink. Jay Suarez reports. UNICEF warned a one-year delay to the payment of teacher salaries in Yemen is exacerbating an education crisis that risks leaving millions of children without education. UNICEF said in April that the crisis risks putting children at greater risk of being married off or recruited as child soldiers for a conflict which has killed at least 10,000 people. UNICEF's representative in Yemen Sharon Varki said a further 4.5 million children now risk losing out on education with 2 million already out of school. Since more than two and a half years of conflict, with more than 2,000 schools partially or completely destroyed, almost 2 million children out of school, education in Yemen is on the brink. Now, with a large number of teachers not having received salaries since the last one year, a further 4.5 million children are at a risk of losing their opportunity to learn. UNICEF is providing support with renovation of damaged schools and with the necessary supplies and equipment, but the needs are enormous. All stakeholders must prioritize the education of children in Yemen, and this remains their only hope for a safe and better future. 
the principal for Arwa School for Girls in the country's southwest, hoped salaries would be paid soon to alleviate teachers' daily struggles in even getting to school to run lessons. The salary crisis largely began last year when the internationally recognized government shifted Yemen's central bank out of Sena, which is controlled by the armed Houthi movement. The government said that Houthis looted the bank and that it was trying to make all payments despite what it calls Houthi obstruction of the transfers, charges denied by the group. Jay Suarez, Eagle News, 1 with 25. Thanks, Jay. Islamic State claims responsibility for deadly Kabul blast. Jeffrey Nolasco reports. The Sunni militant group's AMAK news agency said Islamic State has claimed responsibility for an explosion in Afghan capital Kabul on Tuesday killing multiple people. It said the attack was a suicide mission using an explosive vest in the diplomatic Wazir Akbar Khan neighborhood in the city of Kabul. A Reuters television team counted eight people who appeared to have been killed besides several wounded at the scene, which was shrouded in smoke from the explosion. All the casualties appeared to be Afghan civilians. A public health official said three dead and ten wounded had been taken to city hospitals. Jeffrey Nolasco, Eagle News, 1 with 25. Thank you, Jeffrey. Up next, Trump nominee for Key Justice Post reiterates promise to support Russia probe. Lavrov says allegations of Russian meddling in the U.S. and Europe elections are fantasies. Kremlin notes the U.S. case against ex-Trump aides does not accuse Russia. All of these and more when Eagle News Washington, D.C. returns. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News Washington, D.C. U.S. President Donald Trump's nominee for key justice post reiterates promise to support the Russian probe. Jennifer Blanco Suriano reports. President Donald Trump's nominee to head the U.S. Justice Department's National Security Division on Tuesday repeated an earlier promise to support special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into whether Trump's campaign colluded with Russia during the 2016 election. John Demers, an attorney for Boeing Company who worked at the Justice Department under President George W. Bush, also told lawmakers during a U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee confirmation hearing that have confirmed he will make sure the intelligence community provides unvarnished assessments to the U.S. government regardless of politics. I do support uh, the work of this committee uh, and that investigation. I think it's a very important one. And uh, I do uh, pledge to cooperate with you on that investigation obviously in terms of turning over everything. I, from the outside, I don't, I don't know all the rules, Senator. I'd have to, to uh, talk to other folks at the department about it, but I do support you. Demers made similar comments to lawmakers during his nomination hearing in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee earlier in the month. He told lawmakers at the time he fully accepted the findings of a January report compiled by U.S. intelligence agencies that concluded Russia had interfered in the 2016 election and tried to tilt it in Trump's favor, a finding President Donald Trump has often questioned. This is Joanne Blanco Soriano for Eagle News, and I am one with 25. Thanks, Joanne. Addressing a meeting of the Association of European Businesses in Russia, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said on Tuesday allegations of Russian meddling in election in the United States and Europe are fantasies. Lynn Pence with more. Federal investigators probing Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election charged President Donald Trump's former campaign manager Paul Manafort and another aide Rick Gates with money laundering on Monday. A former Trump advisor, George Papadopoulos, pleaded guilty in early October to lying to the FBI. It was announced on Monday as well. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the Russian meddling allegations in the U.S. and European elections are fantasies. 
Из единого доказательства, как вы знаете, нас обвиняют в вмешательстве выборы не только в Соединенных Штатах, но и в европейских государствах. Недавно еще обвинили, что мы в Москве принимаются решения о том, какого, какого министра назначить в Южноафриканской республике. В общем, нет предела фантазии. It was a sharp escalation of U.S. Justice Department Special Counsel Robert Mueller's five-month-old investigation into alleged Russian efforts to tilt the election in Trump's favor and into potential collision by Trump aides. For Eagle News, I am Lynn Pence, and I am one with 25. Thanks, Lynn. The Kremlin said on Tuesday it had noted that U.S. charges against President Donald Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and another aide, Rick Gates, did not point the finger at Russia over alleged meddling in U.S. politics. Federal investigators probing alleged Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election, something Moscow denies, charged Manafort and Gates with money laundering on Monday. Despite the charges being brought as part of a five-month-old investigation into alleged Russian efforts to tilt the election in Trump's favor and into potentially collusion by Trump aides, the charges, some going back over a decade, centered on Manafort's work for Ukraine's former government, not Russia's. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said Moscow had noted the absence of allegations against Russia in the indictment, saying Moscow had always said it had never meddled in the U.S. election. When asked whether the Kremlin interpreted the indictment as proof that its repeated denial about meddling in the U.S. presidential election had been confirmed, Peskov said Moscow has never felt guilty to feel exonerated. Peskov said the investigation was an internal matter for the United States in which Russia was not involved but was following with interest from afar. He also commented on details of a case against a third former Trump advisor, George Papadopoulos, who pleaded guilty in early October for lying to the FBI. Papadopoulos told investigators about his efforts to set up a meeting between the Trump campaign and the Russian leadership, during which he had said he met a London-based professor boasting of contacts with Russian officials and a Russian woman whom he described as relative of President Vladimir Putin. The case against Papadopoulos also mentions his contacts with someone with links to the Russian Foreign Ministry. When asked what the Kremlin made of the details about someone linked to the Russian Foreign Ministry being cited in the Papadopoulos case, Peskov said the accusation was totally unsubstantiated and laughable. <laughs> A day after a deadly truck attack in which the Department of Homeland Security calls an act of terrorism, the West Side Highway in Lower Manhattan remains a crime scene. U.S. investigators said on Wednesday an Uzbek immigrant suspected of killing eight people in New York City followed plans laid out by the militant Islamic State group and planned the attack weeks in advance. Police said they had interviewed Saifullo Saipov, 29, who was shot and arrested by police moments after the rampage in Lower Manhattan on Tuesday, in which a rental truck was driven down a riverfront bike path. Residents of New York recall what transpired yesterday afternoon. New York resident Jason Herrera says it is not right. It's really tragic that someone would do that on a, on a special day. You know, it's for the kids. It's meant for like all smiles and all that. And it just really sucks that lives were taken on such a day that shouldn't have to be like this, you know? And it pains me. I don't want to see anybody with like frowns on a day like that. And just, it's not right, it's not cool. And I don't know, I just hope justice is served, you know? It's, it's not right. Eric Morales, who missed the tragedy by 20 minutes, said he lucked out on something that does not make sense. Well, I worked uh, about a block away from here, so but I missed it by about 20 minutes. Uh, you know, I think I left this area about 
2.40, I think it happened somewhere around 3. So after that, you know, I was uptown, so I lucked out. Increased police presence is observed all over the city, especially around the area where the attack occurred. Looking at it, it just looks, you know, it looks like a mess. There's a lot of cops. There was cops since I got here early in the morning. I was here at 6 a.m. and there was already a bunch of cops everywhere. It's just, it's really crazy. Activity in the city is slowly getting back to normal, but one thing everyone must not neglect is vigilance. Just a few blocks away from the World Trade Center, which in 2001 became a scene of terrorism, this area will now belong to the growing list of places where violence and innocence met. For Eagle News, I'm Joanne Andrus and I'm one with 25. Aid for Humanity events in New York and in Vancouver. That's next. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will return shortly. Welcome back. This is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. I am Sarah Nachman. An Aid for Humanity event in New York touches the Bronx community. ABC's Maynard Binadai with a story. The growing divide between the rich and the poor continues to widen every day. This income inequality is even more evident in cities like New York. The Morrisania and Cretona section of the Bronx is considered to be the city's poorest neighborhood with the highest poverty rate in the city. A 2015 report estimated that 44% of the residents live below the federal poverty level. Approximately one in five adults are unemployed, making it the highest unemployment rate in the city. In addition, high crime rates and poor health conditions are also rampant in the community. Today, the Iglesia de Cristo is doing their share to help close the gap by holding an Aid for Humanity in the Bronx. In collaboration with the Felix Y. Manalo Foundation, members of the Iglesia de Cristo from the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut areas pitched in to provide much-needed services, food, and clothing to the community. Looking around, I see that there is a great need. Many members of the community are in great need. I decided to volunteer because, personally, I wanted to be able to make a positive impact or a difference um, to be sure that everybody gets the care that they need, even though they don't have that much. These type of activities, they're very good. You know, because there are a lot of people that need help and they're seeking for help. We also got to understand the situation because I myself used to be in that position. So I understand how they feel. So that's why activities like this, it means a lot to me because it gets to help the people that I know and that I truly care about, you know, and it gives them hope. Over 100 residents from the area came today to receive the services provided by the Iglesia Cristo. This winter I'll be warm now. I have coats and I'm just really thankful. Honestly, like from the bottom of my heart, I wouldn't have had coats or, or, or winter vests or anything. And the food, um, the, I was waiting until the first. I was fasting. So thank you. Now I have something to eat today. Being homeless, you know, I'm in a shelter right now. And you know, yeah. I think it's a blessing for me to get anything I could get for us concerning clothing and whatnot. You know what you're doing with the coat drive? You have sweaters, shoes, all that stuff in there. And I That's think right. it's very special and it's something decent that they're doing for people. It was very humbling because I've always been able to afford my own things and now I'm not in that good of position. So it was a very humbling experience walking in. For something positive to pop up, it's, it's really awesome. You know, I'm a firm believer in giving back to the community. So, give, this, is, this is totally what it is, giving back to the community. It's not a coincidence that, that God had placed and allowed that the Bronx Chapel would be here for the members of the Church of Christ to worship. It was placed here to also to reach out to the community, to also bring more souls into the church. Now, the members of the Church of Christ, all of us, we're not, we're not rich. The majority of the members of the church are not rich. But what we do have that's a value, of great value with us is our faith. And even though we don't have much in this life, God allows us to give us the means to also give a helping hand to our fellow men. This help at hand taking place in Bronx, New York is just one of the many service activities being done today throughout the world by the Iglesia de Cristo for their worldwide aid for humanity. Reporting from Bronx, New York, this is Maynard Benadai, one with 25. 
from the East Coast. Let's head west to Vancouver, Canada, where the same worldwide outreach initiative took place. The Iglesia de Cristo, in cooperation with the Felix Y. Manalo Foundation's Aid for Humanity initiative, is here at the Vancouver downtown east side neighborhood to reach out to members of the community who are in need. In line with the religious organization's mission to promote health awareness and improvement, Church of Christ congregations in this part of the country donated clothing, food, and basic necessities at Oppenheimer Park, one of the most impoverished communities in Vancouver. It's always nice to know that this neighborhood isn't forgotten. You know, it is one of the lowest uh, postal codes in uh, Canada, so it's nice to see people wanting to do something and wanting to give something back. So it's nice to it's nice to see people wanting to do what they can to help others that are in need. Uh, For no sure, like uh, people, uh, most of the people here uh, at Oppenheimer Park are on income assistance, and so you know, having a few extra cans of food and another extra blanket is probably something they couldn't afford. So. It's, uh, I'm sure, very much appreciated by them. We are here on location for the Aid for Humanity outreach effort in which members of the Iglesia de Cristo are helping those suffering from poverty and health issue. As one of the leading global charitable institutions, the Felix Y. Manalo Foundation has committed to providing opportunity to those in need. When it comes to the Aid for Humanity, it is one of the commandments of God written in the Bible that the members of the Church of Christ follow and this is intended to help out those people who are in need whether it be our fellow men or members of the Church of Christ alike we extend our help to them by means of food clothing and and the like just to make sure that they have their basic needs so that they can live properly and comfortably in this life the immense community effort here is the first of its kind in Western Canada. With a mission to provide opportunity to those in need, the Felix Y. Manalo Foundation aims to impact communities for years to come. From the Worldwide Aid for Humanity event here in Vancouver, I am Archie Rose Natividad and I am one with 25. That is today's Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Join us tomorrow for a special episode on our coverage of the Worldwide Aid for Humanity events here in the United States and Canada. Visit our website at eaglenews.ph, like us on Facebook, also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash eaglenewsph. On behalf of Eagle News, Washington, D.C., thank you for joining us. I am Sarah Nachman, and I am 1 with 25.